I want to take off on what I talked about uh, two weeks ago. The title for the message this morning is Walking with the Cloud. And I want to read a passage of scripture to start with this morning that is that I, I read two weeks ago. It's found in 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 1. And I'm going to be in the first in the, that first half of 1 Corinthians, uh, starting in verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ but with most of them God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness Let's pray together. Father, give us ears to hear what you're speaking to us as individuals, speaking to us as congregations, Lord. Lord, let us hear what you're speaking prophetically, that, Lord, you would be glorified and that your word and your purposes would go forth, and, Lord, that you would accomplish that which you desire. So, Lord, give us ears to hear what you're speaking. Let the seed of your word be placed in our hearts. Let our hearts contain good soil this morning. Let it take root. And grow and become strong in us, that as we apply it to our lives, Lord, the result will be fruitfulness. Lord, that we would be blessed, but Lord, that your, your, your word, your wisdom would go forth. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Like I said, two weeks ago, I referenced this scripture briefly. I want to take it a step further. Israel is a type of the church. It's a shadow of things that were to come. And God delivered Israel as a nation, the people of Israel, the Hebrews, from the slavery of Egypt. And in the same way, God delivers you and me from the slavery, the bondage of this world, the things that the world has to offer, the things that we get caught up in. How many of you know that God is more powerful than any of those things? And you and I can give testimony to those things that we got caught up in, that God has delivered us from, perhaps is continuing to deliver us from. But in doing so, in delivering Israel out of the bondage of the slavery of Egypt, God's glory appeared to them continually. It manifested as a cloud by day. It manifested as a pillar of fire by night. He says, all were baptized into Moses. All of this nation, all of this group of people experienced the same spiritual experiences. It says that they were all under the cloud. In other words, the cloud being a type of the Holy Spirit. They were all filled with the Spirit of God and moved when the Spirit moved and stayed when the Spirit stayed. It says all were baptized and they passed through the sea. Again, a type of water baptism that we go through. The dead is, is gone and we're resurrected, if you will, alive in Christ. It's a symbolic act and yet there's a spiritual dynamic to baptism that it puts, if you will, the principalities and powers on notice that says, you know what, this is now an individual who is God's, dedicated to him. He's died to his sin. He's resurrected to new life. She's no longer the property, if you will, of the enemy, but now has become one of God's chosen. All had the same spiritual experiences. It says, they, for they drank from the rock, and that rock was Christ, that rock, that spiritual presence that led them, that guided them, that protect them, that stayed with them, was again a type, of experience of Christ that manifested later in the Lord Jesus himself. And so you have this group of people being led by the presence of God in a manifested, visible way, Every day they saw the cloud, every day they saw the fire, at, or every night they saw the fire at night. Yet with most of them, the Bible says, Paul writes here, God was not pleased. You know, wildernesses are given to us as purifying experiences. And during that wilderness, those wilderness times, sometimes there's multiple times when we find ourselves in situations and we say, God, what is this? Or maybe, God, why is this? Or, God, why are you leading me here? This doesn't make me happy. This isn't what I signed up for. 
How many of you know the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves? He knows what we need not to make us happy, but to make us overcomers. His goal isn't necessarily your enjoyment. His goal is that you would sit with him in heavenly places. And he knows what needs to be worked out of each of us in order to enter into all that he has for us. And those things in the wilderness that are not of God get worked out of us. Our actions, our responses, our attitudes, our motives. But let me ask you a group of questions. How does a group of people that experience the manifest presence of God every day and every night on a continual basis miss God? How do they miss God when they're experiencing so much? I mean, think about it. What would it look like if you drove in here this morning and there was a cloud of his glory that had descended upon this, this room? And it wasn't just any cloud. It wasn't just like we have fog this morning, okay? There would be something different, something there. And what would it be like if you came in here about 9.30 tonight and instead of the lights being on, there was, there was fire that covered the sanctuary, that's what they were experiencing. And yet they missed God with most of them. The Bible says God was not well pleased. How does a group of people miss God in this process? And Paul says that these things to follow that I'm going to talk about here in just a minute are given as examples to us and they're recorded to show how our actions and our attitudes many times expose the underlying motives and underlying attitudes, underlying beliefs of our hearts. Very simply, the people looked backwards instead of looking forward. They looked backward to where they had been, to what they had used to know, used to experience, rather than forward into what God was leading them. We read on in 1 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So he's saying here is, and he hasn't stated them yet, what I'm about to tell you are examples of the reason that the children of Israel died in the wilderness instead of entering into the promised land. Now notice this is New Testament and he's talking to the church here. He's not saying these things happen to that group back there and don't apply. Paul makes them apply here and he says they're examples to us. How many of you desire to experience the presence of God in deeper measure? I hope we all can say that. But we live in a culture, and particularly a church culture, that wants the glory without paying the price. We want the experience, and yet we don't want the underlying responsibility to live as kingdom people. We want to see the stuff. We just don't want to have to pay that price to experience it. These things became our examples. And he says this, Do not become idolaters, as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. They're given to us as examples of how they missed God. And these are things that I'm going to talk about that if we allow them in our lives, will separate us from the presence of God. Doesn't mean you're not saved. Doesn't mean God's spirit has left you. It simply means that what we do in our activities expose sometimes the inner workings of our heart. And God simply says, you know, until I work that out of you, it's hard for me to use you any further. It's hard for me to utilize you in my kingdom until these things are taken care of. They're detailed with the intent that we should not do as Israel did. In other words, Paul doesn't want the church to make the same mistake. 
He says, do not become idolaters. The story here is found in Exodus 32, starting in verse 4. Aaron received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And then the children of Israel said, this is your God, O Israel, that has brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And here Aaron is the priest of the Lord. He made a golden calf out of the jewelry that, by the way, God had allowed the, the, the Hebrews to take from the Egyptians as spoil. So it was God's blessing. The children of Israel used God's blessing to create an idol, which the calf, by the way, was the God that the Egyptians worshipped. And they proclaimed that this calf was their God. They gave credit to the calf for what God had done. In fact, Aaron even built an altar to this calf. He proclaimed a feast to this new Lord. And they brought offerings to it. They sacrificed to it. And the Bible says the people were happy. But this was offensive to God. God was not pleased. Why? Because credit was given to another God for what God himself had done. They had given credit to someone or something else. It wasn't that the, the, the image itself, I mean, the golden calf was a golden calf. It's when they ascribed deity to it. It's when they ascribed credit to that. And then they burnt offerings to it. They sacrificed to it. They worshipped before it. And this was offensive to God. Let me ask you a question this morning. At what altar are you worshiping? At what altar are you worshiping? You may not be a very religious person, but all of us have an altar that we worship at. Where do you spend your time? Where do you spend your money? Where's your attention going? What are you loyal to? At what altar are you worshiping? And we come in here and we come on Sundays. How many of you know that the kingdom of God is not simply a, on a Sunday morning from 10 to 12? The kingdom of God works best from 12 Sunday noon until the next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And this is just a rally. This is just a celebration of who God is and what he has done for us. And we give him glory and honor. The best thing we do here is worship him and minister under his presence. But make no mistake, this is not the end. This is just an interlude. Where are you spending your time? What are you giving your attention to during the week? Is it the things of God? Is it his purpose? At what altar are you worshiping? See, the glory of God, if we want to walk with the cloud, the glory of God requires loyalty to him and to him first, and to him alone. Everything else gets ordered under his presence. Everything else gets ordered under our commitment to him and his ways in the things of God. The first Old Testament commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second thing he mentions here is he says, do not commit sexual immorality. And this story comes from Numbers 25. Now, now Israel remained in the Acadia Grove, and the people began to commit holotry, ha, ha, harlotry excuse me, with the women of Moab. And they invited the people to sacrifice to their gods, and the people also bowed down to their gods. And so Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Israel found themselves... Bumping up against neighboring people. And the, some of the men of Israel began to basically have sexual relations with some of the, the women of Moab. 
And God had said, no, don't do this. And they committed adultery. And that adultery was an entryway into worshiping the Moabite gods. It was an entryway into worshiping something that God had said don't do. Now they're putting another God before God, but they're also doing something that he expressly said, hey, don't do this. And the Lord's anger was aroused against them because the men of Israel had defiled themselves in this way. Basically, they had led Israel astray. 23,000 of them died as a result of this. So Paul says, listen, I want you to be aware. This is an example. Beware of sexual temptation. How many of you know that we live in a very sexual culture? We can't get away from it. For most of us, perhaps, we've even become immune to it. We see it in our advertisements. We see it in a in television program. We see it in a lot of different areas of our culture. And I believe the Lord would say, beware. Keep yourself pure from this sin. Now, it's wonderful that we live under a new covenant because God judged the children of Israel, and yet he says, if you have fallen, confess your sin so that God will forgive you. You see, God doesn't excuse sin. He doesn't close his eyes to sin. But he says, if you will confess it, I will find and you will have a way through that so that you no longer have to hold that against yourself because I don't hold that against you. But the way to that is to confess it, to get it out from you and say, you know what, this is what I have done. And the Lord says, yes, I knew that all along. I wanted you to say that. And now I'm going to extend forgiveness to you because you have asked for it. And my love of you is unconditional. Repent. Don't do it anymore. And turn from it. You see, the glory of God, walking with the cloud of God, requires purity from the sins of this world. You want the presence of God? Walk in purity. You want the presence of God and the power of God to move in your life? Then sanctify yourself, set yourself apart under the things of the Lord. That's where it starts. The third thing that he talked about here was do not tempt Christ. The story here is Numbers 21, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Israel had grown tired of the blessing of God. They had forgotten what Egypt was like. They were living in the moment. They said, God, Moses, why have you brought us here? There's no food, there's no water, and this manna that appears every morning, we don't like it anymore. Can't you do better than this? Can't you do something that I think you should do, God? Can't you, can't you make our lives like we want them to be? Can't you make us all happy? Can't you make us all rich? Can't you make us all beautiful? Can't you make us all like the right weight? Like tonight? So that I could wake up in the morning and be buff? God, why don't you just do what, you know, God, it would be better if I told you how to run my life rather than you asking, telling me how to run my life. Do you understand the difference? God, you would really do well if you just listened to me. Here's how you could change and work all these things out. And it would be so much better, God, if you just listened to me. How many of you know that God's ways are higher than our ways? That his thoughts are higher than our thoughts? That we dare not tell God how, and sometimes, you know, we, we, we don't, we wouldn't do that intentionally. How many times do our prayers reflect more our desires and the way we think God should do things 
And so in effect, we begin to complain and we tempt God. We tempt God to judge us. And God provided a way out. The Bible says God sent serpents among them that bit them. Many of the people died. And God provided a way out. Moses fashioned a snake on a pole that when the Israelites looked at it, they were healed. I think God just said, get over yourself, people. It was a reminder of what God had done and who he was. How many of you know that walking in the glory of God is not always easy? I think some of us have this idea that if, we walk in, or if we're walking in the presence of God and, you know, that we, we were experiencing deeper and deeper, that somehow this is just going to be a glorious time. I would say and, and dare say that if God visits us in an even deeper ways, which I believe he will, that your lives are not going to get easier. Because the glory of God requires a commitment from us that goes beyond where any of us are right now. It requires prayer, it requires fasting, it requires a set-apart, sanctified lifestyle. There's a reason that God hasn't visited us with His glory in this way. There's a reason, I believe, that the church, particularly in our country, is not experiencing the presence of God like God would desire. And the reason is that we haven't paid the price in our own willingness to submit ourselves to the things of God that he's simply asking us to. How many of us talk about prayer more than we actually pray? We all think it's a good idea. But how many of us actually, how many of you actually spent 15 minutes last week praying? Actually focused Dedicated prayer. And I'm not saying this to judge anybody or condemn anybody. I'm just saying Paul gives us this example to say don't do the things that Israel did. Don't tempt God. Sometimes when we walk in the presence and the glory of God, some things that once were new, we begin to take for granted. They become commonplace. And we become satisfied. We want bigger. We want better. Bigger miracles, better miracles. We want more provision, more blessing. But see, going deeper with God doesn't always look bigger or better. Going deeper with God may mean more self-sacrifice. It may mean more setting apart for Him. It may mean that we lay aside some of the things that have been good so that we can enter into what's best. I'm going to re-say what I said two weeks ago. I believe God is looking for a people to pour his presence out upon. But we as his people have to be ready for his presence. We have to be ready and willing to walk at the level that his presence requires. It may require self-sacrifice from us. We don't like to hear that in our culture. It may require something that we don't necessarily want to give up. But God is asking us to. And how many of us have tempted God by saying, well, God, I want what you want, but I want what I want also. God, I want those things. God, I want your glory. God, I want the experiences. But God, I also want to keep and stay in control of my life too. I don't want to go too far and actually lose my life in you. And yet that's exactly what Jesus calls us to, to lose ourselves. He says, if you would lose your life for me, you will find it. It's a radical commitment. The glory of God asks us to be content and thankful with what he has already done, yet also desiring to go deeper and experience more. Do you see the balance? He wants us to experience, he wants us to go deeper, but he doesn't want us to complain about the things that he's already done. And that's the fourth thing that he talked about here, complaining. The story here is number 16, verse 41. The next day all the congregation and the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Now there's a backstory here. There was a rebellion. 
against Moses and a rebellion against the Levitical order that God had established. Basically, a group of people raised up. They were, they were Levites, and they said, well, we also hear God. Moses, who are you? We also hear God, so what we say needs to count. And God had never released him into that. And God got angry with these people. And he caused the death of this group of people. And when the deaths happened, the rest of Israel complained. And they said, you, you, you've, you've killed the, the, the children of Israel. Now, the thing is, God was ready to kill the whole lot of them. He was ready just to say, you know what? You're going to complain about my ways and what I have done. Fine, Moses, I'm going to raise up a people from you. Stand away from all these people. And because Moses did not, he was a leader, he said, you know what, God, I'm going to intercede for these, please. And he and Aaron basically interceded for the people, and it stopped what God was going to do because of intercession. By the way, that's the power of intercession, that our prayers really do matter. And that when you and I come with God's purpose before the Lord, he hears and he acts. See, I believe God finds complaining against him and his ways offensive. Complaining against God is really saying, God, you're not doing a good enough job. We could do better. God, you really don't know what you're doing. God, I could figure it out better. And in doing so, we bring God down to the level of our humanness because we can only see at the level at which we have been released. Walking with God's glory means accepting God's ways even when we don't necessarily understand them. You and I, if we are serious about the things of God, are not going to understand everything that happens. There's going to be some things that we go, hmm. There's going to be some things which we say at first, that can't be God. There's going to be some things that say, God, is that really you? I didn't think it would be like this. And yet walking with God's glory means accepting that God is in control and he knows better than we what needs to happen and we're willing to go with him and walk with him. And so I go back to 1 Corinthians 10, now verse 11. Paul again says, now all these things happened to them as examples for us. And they were written for our admonition as a warning upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. But the one who thinks that they stand, the one who thinks that their life is so perfect, so above board, that they're somehow immune from these kinds of things and temptations, take heed, beware, that lest when you stand you fall. Let anyone who thinks they're above falling into these activities stop and realize that none of us are immune. But Paul also encourages us. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You see, God's not asking for our perfection. He's factored our humanness into the equation of his salvation. He said, I'm dealing with that and have dealt with that in Christ. He says, if you will confess your sin, I am faithful, I am just to forgive your sin. You complained against me, ask my forgiveness. You tested me, you tempted me, ask my forgiveness. Because when we ask forgiveness from God, it humbles us. And we have to come to God and say, okay, God, in essence, you're right, I'm wrong. You're greater, I'm lesser. And it puts us in a place of humility. The thing about it is, we none of us like that. None of us like to be in that place. We all like to think we're just wonderful. Well, you are wonderful in the Lord, but none of you are greater than, 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 than God. And so God says, come on his merits. 
come by his instruction and protocol. No temptation is unique to you. Many of us like to think, well, you know what? You don't know what I've been through. No, I probably don't. You don't know what I've been through. But you know what? Somebody else has gone through the same thing. Somebody else has gotten addicted here. Somebody else has fallen into a relationship there. Somebody else has done stupid things that we don't even want to talk about. In fact, most all of us in this room, at some level, have gotten ourselves involved in situations and circumstances that we'd rather not talk about and basically we'd like to forget. And the reality of our lives is that God has delivered us from those things. And he's delivered us, many of us, from the consequences that we should have experienced that in his grace we didn't. Thank you, Jesus. That's worth worshiping about. He says, no temptation is unique to you. Others have fallen before you and others will fall after you. But God is faithful. He says, you will not be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will provide a way out that you can choose if you want to. It's up to you. He will provide the way out. And even if you fall, he's already provided that way out. So basically, all he is saying is, come. Come to me. Accept me. And I will give you rest. Now, like I mentioned before, we're also under a new covenant. These stories, these examples, they were under an old covenant. They committed offensive things against God. Most of the time, God just said, sorry, see ya, bye. Under the new covenant, we do these kinds of things and we come to God as a child comes to a loving father and says, Father, forgive me. And he does. And he washes us clean. It's as if we never had committed these things against him. God forgives us when we fall. And there's no condemnation, the Bible says, for those of us in Christ Jesus. And that's the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That under the old, these sins brought death and the wrath of God. But under the new, we now have a mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, that has taken our penalty for us. And when we begin to realize who we are and who God has created us to be, we also can realize who and what we're not. And that is when we can really begin to walk in his glory. It's not the glory of our perfection. It's the glory of his strength. It's not the glory of who, how good we are. It's the glory of how great God is. And we're humbled by our humanness, yet amazed by God's grace. That in spite of our shortcomings, God chooses to show us the glory of his presence and power. Let's stand together. Some of us don't take advantage of the new covenant that we've been born into. Some of us, we don't want to take advantage, we don't want to have to do anything, and yet we want the benefits. And it doesn't work that way. God doesn't excuse your sin. He simply provides a way out. He covers our sin, but we have to take advantage of that covering. It doesn't just happen automatically. The Bible is very clear. John 1.9 says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful, He is just to forgive and to cleanse, but we have to confess it. And so this morning, I didn't want to preach this message. I'd much rather talk about other things. But I believe God wants us to begin to prepare our hearts and our lives. It's not just our hearts that say, oh Lord, we love you. Yes, we do. And then we live like the devil the rest of the time. It doesn't work that way. We say, Lord, we have to be sanctified under your purposes, sanctified by your blood. But Lord, we choose by an act of our will to submit these things to you.
We choose, Lord, to lay aside and to leave the things that you call sin. We choose, Lord, to put you first, that nothing and no one else is ahead of you. We choose, Lord, to accept your ways. We choose, Lord, to walk with you in relationship. We choose, Lord, to humble ourselves. And yet, Lord, we walk as sons and as daughters and as friends. If we say we want God's glory to lead us, we must be careful not to fall into these sins that kept a generation of Israel from seeing the land of promise. As we worship this morning, if God has prompted your heart, I want to invite you to come to the altar. It's an act of your will that says, God, I am responding to you. And there's some here that don't want to make that declaration. You simply want to stay in your seat and say, well, I don't want anybody to look at me. I just kind of want to be between me and God. I'm going to let you in on something that when you do that, there's a very great chance that nothing is going to happen inside. It's not that God's not listening. It's just that you're not serious. And I say that not to condemn anybody, but I just say I know that when you respond to God as an act of your will and a public declaration that says, I am going to go for God. I'm not going to allow these things to remain in my life. That's when God says, that man is serious about me. That woman really wants to walk with me. Because they're willing to put it on the line and it's willing to be a public declaration. And so if the Lord is drawing you, don't get caught up in emotion in this. If the Lord is drawing you and saying, you know what, this is an area that you need to lay aside and ask my forgiveness for, I'm going to ask you to come forward as we worship. Someone will come and pray with you. You simply confess whatever it is that God has prompted you. This is a very safe group of people to do this with because all of us, for the most part, have been to this altar. And the people that are going to pray with you understand what is happening inside of you, that this is an unburdening and a laying down of something that God desires for you to lay down and a picking up of something that God has for you. It's walking with Him. It's walking with His glory. Let's worship together. You are a worshiping congregation. Psalm 22, 3, the Lord inhabits or is throned upon the praises of His people. And something is manifested in His presence. When we as a group of people together come and sincerely worship Him, it's His presence that changes us. It's His presence that transforms us. Let's respond to God. I invite you to come.